never sat down to preach, but um, my children have caused another injury in my life. Your kids get to a point where you don't wrestle anymore because you, you're the one that gets hurt, and then you stop playing competitive sports against them because in tennis, they've learned how to hit the ball far away from me where I have to run and I twisted my knee about three weeks ago. And uh, anyway, some people say you're just getting old, Pastor, so that's what it is, maybe. But I'm gonna sit and stand and work through this so that the pain is not too intense. I love you guys, thank God for you. Open, the, open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, as we continue to study about what the Bible calls Babylon the Great. And we're looking at the characteristics of the future world empire of Antichrist, specifically the future world religion of Antichrist, much of which is going to what we believe happened in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, that there is this going to be this one world uh, political empire, one world religion, one world currency, uh, and ultimately the worship of, it will culminate with the worship of Antichrist, where Antichrist turns on this system, turns on this Babylon the Great, and there's a separation we read about in Scripture, but, but we're understanding what this is. You say, Pastor, why are we doing this? Guys, listen, your biblical worldview is going to shape the way you live your life. If you understand the Bible, the more you understand the Bible, the more it will impact the way you live and the, the approach of life. Everything you read, everything you look at, everything you watch, every news broadcast, everything that you encounter in your life will be filtered through the Word of God. And I believe you are able to, with that, you are able to face the world with great wisdom. You're able to understand current affairs and current events through the lens of Scripture. Now, guys, if there's any prejudice, if there's any worldview, if there's any perspective that I want to have facing life, it is a biblical perspective. And there's no more, no more ability for us to be shaped in our worldview than to, than to read and to study the book of Revelation. It has packed full for us uh, understanding of what is going to happen in the future. A future world empire that when we look at the world and then we look at what the Bible says this empire looks like, we begin to see the world conforming to the image of what the Bible says is to come. Now, if you don't have a biblical worldview and you're looking at the events and you don't have a perspective of eternal life, eternal salvation, the grace of God, the gospel of God, the revelation of God, guys, you're going to struggle right now. You're going to be dismayed. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to be defeated. You're going you're gonna to face this world with a lot of doubt and a lot of fear and perplexity. But when you have a biblical worldview, you're going to face the world with great hope and great perspective about what our role is right now as God's people, what is our role right now in bringing the light and the truth of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ into the lives of those that God has put in our life? And so I want to encourage you to live and grow in your knowledge of Scripture. And that's why our church, that's why we take the Bible, we, we read the Scripture, and then we explain, talk about what the Bible is saying, try to understand better what it is. Some people approach Revelation with great fear and anxiety. Um, we approach the scripture with, with humility, but, but guys, listen, the Bible tells us and explains the imagery. So many places, the imagery is explained and we know exactly what the Bible is talking about. And there's many places here today that we're going to see that as an example. So as we've been looking, uh, just to review the last few characteristics of future world empire, Babylon. We see that Babylon is, a, is seen as a harlot. Um, this religious system, this false 
religious system. Uh, many times nations and countries are called that in the Old Testament. Even Israel was called that in the Old Testament because she, God's chosen people, were wandering away from their first love. They were wandering away from God as their first love, and they were beginning to serve idols. They were going after false religion. And this is ultimately what happens in the world. And it's what happens, guys, listen, in the apostate church. Our biblical worldview of Revelation helps us understand why we see so much shift in the church today, in the Protestant church even today, shifting away from the belief in the inerrancy and authority of Scripture over to the authority of men, over to the authority of culture, over to the authority of science. And we see a shifting toward secular humanism in the church. You say, why, that? why is that? Because it's a sign of great Babylon the harlot. A vision of the woman Babylon in the wilderness. We saw that in verses 3 through 5. Babylon is seen as a bloodthirsty empire. Killing true Christians. Hating true Christians. Now guys, this is something that culminates in this seven year tribulation that's coming upon the earth. But it's something we see today a great hatred toward those that believe in the authority of Scripture and believe absolute authority, absolute truth, absolute morality. And we believe that Jesus never changes. We believe God never changes. He's immutable. And that there is a hatred for people that believe in the unchanging Word of God. We see that happening and it will culminate in the tribulation with Babylon. Babylon is seen as a united federation of nations of nations that wage war against the witnesses of Jesus. Uh, this united federation of nations, we're going to finish that part today and then move into this last point, number five, is that Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, will effortlessly defeat the greatest army ever assembled in the battle of Armageddon. Jesus, the King of all kings. Notice that. Uh, scripture with me as we read it together. Revelation 17, verse 14. These, speaking of the federation of nations coming against the Lord Jesus at Armageddon, these will wage war against the Lamb. Oh, buddy, you don't ever want to wage war against the Lamb. If you're going to wage war, don't ever wage war against Jesus. And the Lamb will overcome them. Why? Because he is the Lord of all lords. The Lord of lords. Capital L, Lord of lowercase l, lords. Y'all look at me, church. The lords in this world are lowercase lords. The kings of this earth today are lowercase kings. The presidents, the rulers, those in authority, those in government are lords, lowercase lords. Don't ever worship lowercase lords. Okay, don't ever, don't ever give your allegiance to lowercase lords. Pray for them, the Bible says, amen? Pray for wisdom in their life. Pray that God would lead them. Pray for them. But don't ever worship them. Amen? I'm on one campaign. I am in a campaign. Did you know that? I'm in a campaign. I'm in a campaign to lead people to Jesus. That's my campaign. Because he is the Lord of lords. And the king of kings. That is my Lord Jesus Christ. Why does he overcome them? Because he's the king. Because he's the Lord. And those who are with him, everybody say with him. Those who are with him, praise the Lord, are the called and chosen and faithful. I hope you remember those three words when you lead today. The called, the chosen, and the faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the, where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Let me say this about with him real quick, the reason I had you repeat it. Guys, what we believe 
is when Jesus comes to this earth to triumph as the King of kings and Lord of lords, we believe from our biblical worldview that we, the elect, are with him. We are with him. Coming back with him. Now, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. You don't know where I stand. Not all of our pastors believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. We agree to disagree. We love each other. Just because they got it wrong, you know, it doesn't matter, I guess. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe the church is going to be raptured to be with the Lord in the air before the tribulation begins. Pastor John, Pastor Edward, don't listen to them. But anyway, just kidding. But when we're with him means that we're raptured to be with the Lord in the air, um, to be with the Lord forever but that we are actually going to come back to this earth with the Lord, that we are going to actually come with him, that we are going to be with him. Now, I don't believe we're going to be having anything necessarily to do with this triumph of these uh, empires that, that, co uh, that coordinate these, uh, this federation of nations that are defeated and destroyed by the Lord Jesus. I believe that just as God is powerful to breathe the stars in place, when Jesus comes, guys, it's going to be a, a dynamic defeat of the greatest army that's ever come up against any one and that it's going to be effortless you see when God does miracles when God does things like create the universe it's effortless for him God does not get tired God did not get tired when he created the stars and the moon and the galaxies and light and separated the light and darkness and created the earth and created man and woman, male and female, when he created them. And every species and every life and every, every bird and every tree that he created. God did not get weary or tired and it was effortless. And God, when Jesus comes back, guys, it is going to be effortless for him to defeat these who have coalesced against the Lord. And we believe we'll be with him. I want to go into verse 9, if you would back up to verse 9, and we want to talk about this as we move forward to the victory of the Lamb. We want to see what is coalescing against him so that we understand what these armies and what these nations and what it is that's coming together uh, just ahead of the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of the Lord. Verse 9, it says, here is the mind which has wisdom. <coughs> Here's the mind which has wisdom. Let me just say this real quick. This place is packed today. Wonderful. I love worshiping with a, with a crowd of people worshiping the Lord today. You've had wisdom today. The wisdom, the, wis, the decision that was brought by wisdom for you today as moms and dads and young people, grandmas and grandpas, the wisdom was this. We're going to get up and go to church today. We're going to get up and we're going to make Jesus first in our life. And we're going to worship the Lord with the body of Christ today. We're going to exalt him. And let me just tell you, it's a reboot on Sundays, isn't it? It's where we get, it's where we restart. And many times, even as, as, a, as your pastor, when, I, when we are worshiping, it is, it, is a, it is a place and time in a life of a Christian where we stop and say, Lord, this is the first day of this week. And, and really the first thing I want to do, Lord, this week is I want to once again surrender my life to you. And Lord, I want to live for you. And, and, and Lord, this week, here are some things that I, Lord, how I want to live for you this week. You know, and things that we're doing and thinking about as we're worshiping the Lord. And so this was wisdom. It's also wisdom. The wisdom that John is talking about here is the mind which has wisdom. is the mind that is approaching studying the book of Revelation. Here is the mind that has wisdom. You've said, we want to understand this. We're here to learn this. Um, and there's been some not so fun parts about this. Uh, this is not rosy and fluffy and, and uh, easy sometimes to understand, but, it's, but, it, but it brings wisdom in our life to face the future. Then he says this, here it is. Now remember, John is perplexed by seeing this harlot Babylon and seeing riding on 
Antichrist, the beast. And he's, he's wondering, what is this? Here he says, he's, he's, he's explaining that. The seven heads that you see are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. He's seeing seven heads. And John is, is learning through the angel telling him, these seven heads that you see are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are what? Seven kings. Seven kings. And then he tells you when these kings have existed. He said, to John, on the island of Patmos around 90 A.D., he is telling him this in, in, in current moment in time for John to understand. The angel says, of these kings, five have fallen. One is, okay, five kings have fallen. One king is, right now is. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain for a little while. The beast, which was and is not, is himself also an eighth. Now, this throws you for a loop when you hear about seven mountains, which are seven kings, and then the angel throws in an eighth. This eighth is something that for many have looked at this and gone, and, and we do. We kind of, an eighth? What's the eighth? And how is the beast one of the seven and also the eighth? I'm going to share with you my, pers my thought on that but is himself, and he's talking about Antichrist because he's talking about the false or the uh, resurrection of Antichrist head wound. And every time you see the beast, which was and is not, and himself also is a reference to the, uh, either the miraculous resurrection of Antichrist where his head wound, and then he rises from the dead. Everybody sees this. Hey, that should have killed him, but it didn't kill him. And people go to worship Antichrist, follow Antichrist. Just as people follow Jesus because of his resurrection, people follow Antichrist because, hey, this guy is miraculous. He, he was dead and now he's alive again. Now, whether that's fake or whether it's real, we won't know until it happens, but many worship him. But we know this is talking about Antichrist. He must remain for a little while. And he is himself also the eighth and is one of the seven. And he also goes to destruction. I love how the angel just encourages John in the midst of this conversation about the power and authority of Babylon. And he says, hey, but he's going to destruction. He just kind of tells, he tells you in the midst of telling you something that's going to happen that's really bad, where there's this Babylonian empire, this Babylonian kingdom, the killing and murdering of Christians, this bloodthirsty empire, this fake resurrection, this antichrist. Oh, but by the way, he's going to destruction. And I say amen. So here's in the mind of wisdom, listen closely, be willing to venture into these verses with faith. Seven heads, seven mountains on which the woman sits. Let's talk about these. Some have said the seven mountains are Rome. Some say the woman is the Roman Catholic Church. I believe uh, with, other, with other scholars that that doesn't go far enough. That's too narrow a view of the false religion of Catholicism. The false religion of Catholicism. You say, Pastor, why is it a false religion? Guys, we are not saved by our works. We are saved by the grace of God through faith. If anyone, even an angel, comes in this church and preaches another gospel, the Bible says, let him be accursed. If a person is preaching works righteousness, guys, they are no longer preaching the good news of the gospel. They are preaching a false way. The Eucharist, confession, do good, live good, be good, work your way to heaven. Then you go to purgatory, which is nowhere in the Bible, to try to work, all, work off all of your bad stuff, sins, and then somebody hopefully can pray you into or lead you in out of purgatory into heaven. And that ultimately where it is today in Catholicism is that everybody eventually makes it to heaven through purgatory and into heaven, except maybe Hitler. It's not a true gospel message 
that we preach that leads people to true salvation and saving faith in Jesus Christ. Seven mountains. So what are they? If it's not just Rome, if it's not just uh, the Catholic Church or some other false religion, what is it? What are these seven mountains? Seven kings. It says seven um, empires. Five have fallen. Now, if, if you're thinking, if John is hearing this in AD 90, he's hearing five have fallen, then he's thinking of five kings, five empires that have risen to power and then fallen. Um, some scholars believe that these would, these would be considered possible. Uh, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon itself, Medo-Persia, and Greece. That these are the five that have risen and then fallen. It says five have fallen. So we're looking at five historic kings and empires that have risen and then fallen. Five have fallen. One is... Now, we'd have to think of this as Rome. One is, one empire that is, right now is, the empire that is exiled, John, for the most part, to the island of Patmos where he's writing this revelation to us, is the empire that ultimately excommunicated him. One is, of these uh, six empires, the ones, the five that have fallen, one is, These are political heirs of Babel. These are religious heirs of the historic kingdom of Babel, where the word Babylon comes from. Pantheism and idolatrous polytheism. You know, there's a lot of polytheists in the church today, in churches today. They're not in the church, they're in churches They're not true followers of Jesus because they believe there's many ways to get to God, many paths to get to God. They're polytheists. Uh, They're pantheists. They're not monotheistic. They're not believing in one God. They're believing in many gods. It's amazing. And I, I... I don't know this to be true. I wonder if we surveyed across across the crowd today how many of you believe that there are more than one way to get to the Father, to get to heaven. If you would say, oh yeah, I, you know, I think there are many paths, many religions that lead people to God, lead people to heaven. You are a polytheist. And you are not believing in the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father, the only way to the Father is through me, Jesus said about himself. One way, one way. You say, what about what all these people that don't believe in Jesus, that aren't following to Je- that aren't following Jesus, that are rejecting Jesus, folks? They are lost. They are dead in their sins. They are not forgiven. They are not washed in the blood of the Lamb. They are not surrendered to the Lordship of Christ in their life. They are dead souls. They're not worshipers of God, and they will be led into deeper and deeper levels of deception. Deception. If you are not a believer in the Jesus of the Bible, listen, you are very vulnerable to the deception of the world. And in fact, you're not even able to understand through the spiritual illumination of Scripture. Did you know that? Did you know that if you are not a follower of Jesus that you cannot even understand the Bible because these truths are spiritually discerned? That the Holy Spirit that wrote this book actually is inside of you testifying to you about the truth of these these letters, the truth of this book. You say, well, that's why I don't understand the Bible. I've read the Bible, I don't understand the Bible. It's because you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you that will help you understand the Bible. It's called illumination. It's powerful, spiritual. People that, are, people that thought they were saved in church, then they truly encounter God, surrender their life to Christ, indwell with the Holy Spirit. They start reading the Bible and they're like, I understand it now. I get it now. Light bulbs click on every morning. Praise God. Yes, it's because you're born again. You are a new creation in Christ. And you're able to understand the Bible. You say, Pastor, what do I do if I don't understand the Bible and I don't believe? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not the invented Jesus of our culture, not the made up Jesus in your head, but the Jesus of the Bible, the creator of the universe. 
believe upon him, the Bible says you will be saved, born again. He must remain for a little while, the scripture says. This refers to a short-lived empire, 42 months. That's pretty short compared to Babylon, compared to Medo-Persia, compared to Egypt, you know, where empires lasted for hundreds of years. This empire, guys, really is, is pretty short. The beast, which was and is not, is himself also an eighth. What does that mean? How many of y'all are interested in this stuff? Raise your hand if you say, I'm interested in this. What does it mean that he's a part of the seven and he's the eight? How does that work? I'm glad y'all are interested. Thank you. That's great. I'm going to give you my opinion. (laughs) I believe where it says that he's one of the seven is referring to the first half of the tribulation. Where Antichrist and Babylon are really united together. Where they're working together in one world currency, one world federation of nations, one world government, one world religion where everybody's together in that sense. Where he becomes the eighth is the second part of the tribulation, where it is in and of itself a a distinct empire, where Antichrist sets himself up to be God, the only one to be worshipped. And then the mark of the beast, the false prophet, and the People that have to take the mark of the beast and have the number of his name and that you cannot buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. And all that stuff happens from that midpoint on that this potentially, this is my opinion, that he's one of the seven in the first part of his reign and his first part of leadership in the first part of the tribulation and is ultimately the eighth empire or the eighth mountain as scripture says here in the second part. Verse 12 and 13 Rome, uh, Revelation 7, 12 and 13, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose. They give their power and authority to the beast. Ten horns. You got seven heads and you got ten horns. Ten horns, we know what the horns are. Everybody say, we know what the horns are. The Bible tells us what the horns are. Everybody's like, horns and heads and all this stuff. The Bible tells you what they are. This is, these are visions that John is seeing and the angel's explaining to him. And it is very important that we understand the imagery. The imagery has something to do with the purpose and the power and, the, uh, and really the uh, The horns, specifically the heads and the horns, represent kings. It represents empires. Horns represents something that's going to smash you. You see an animal with horns, look out. Don't get close to that. That horn's going to get you. You know what I'm saying? And this is what we see in the imagery, and the imagery means something, but we understand what they are. They're ten kings. These have one purpose, 10 horns, 10 future kings. They receive a kingdom. Guys, understand these are speaking to John of future kings. They cannot represent known or any other earlier generations from where John is writing. They are a part of Antichrist's future empire, we believe. Um, And we ask the question, could some of these kings be on the earth today. Could some of these horns, these kings, these with authority, these with the purpose and power to crush, be in authority now? I don't know. Glad you asked. I wish I had an answer. But they could be. Some of the kings, some of the rulers, (laughs) some of the lords, lowercase l, of our day could in fact be these horns, these kings that we see given authority in the tribulation to mount up and come against our Lord Jesus Christ at the battle of Armageddon. I know some battling kings, rulers, that I would say if there's a horn 
If there's somebody who wants to crush people, if there's somebody that wants to kill people, that man would probably be one of them. Y'all know who we're talking about, right? What is that? This is the spirit of Babylon. This is the spirit, the horns, the authority, the power, the dominance, and the desire, the bloodthirsty empires, the, the desire to kill innocent people. See, when you have a biblical worldview, when you see things in the world that are happening, you go, man, that is the spirit of the Antichrist. That is the spirit of the lawless one. That is the spirit of the 10 kings. That is what's going to culminate in the tribulation. I wonder, I wonder if these are already assembling, if they're already uniting, they're already coming together. Have any of y'all heard the phrase, the new world order? Any, anybody, anybody heard that? You know, unless you're in the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, I don't want to hear about a new world order. Anybody say amen? When you mention a new world order, hello, that is some scary stuff. I wonder when our president mentioned that, and it could have just come from somewhere in his brain this week. But I wonder when our president, here's, here's the shocking um, view of that potential. I mean, I don't know. I'm speculating. But a group of powerful people in a room where they've been talking about, this is the way my imagination goes. I'm sorry, it's conspiracy theory. A group of men in a room talking about a new world order. Hey, but don't call it that. Don't say that. And then somebody, the ruler of the free world, steps up and says new world order. Wouldn't it be horrible if there's a group of men in a room going, he wasn't supposed to say that. New world order. That is exactly what the ten horns is. It is a new world order. It is the coming together, the uniting of Federation of nations and the most powerful people on the earth that are not going to war against each other, but that are going to war against the witnesses of Jesus and against Jesus himself. Who might these be? I'm not even going to speculate today. Could it be that these rulers or dictators begin to align themselves together in our lifetime, in our uh, the age of the church just before the rapture of the church. Yes, I believe that you, we could see the trends. We could see the ways in which they unite themselves together, align themselves economically, militarily, politically, currency, all these things. Um, it appears that these kings have supreme authority it doesn't appear that these kings are going back in a democracy, going back to their people and go, hey, let's vote on whether we're going to align ourselves with this whole antichrist that, that had a head wound and rose from the dead. I don't think they're going back to their people to vote on it. I think they have been given authority and they come and they give their authority to antichrist. They align themselves with this supposed supernatural human for one hour. I believe this is a figure of speech. I believe it ultimately says how brief their rule is. Uh, and it is going to be. They, they, they receive that authority. They, they know they have the authority. They're living in that authority. And then they, they're given it, I think, by Satan and by Antichrist, and then they give that to the Antichrist for full power, world rulership. All right. Then we move to, to number five. This is where we want to um, end for today. And we're going to just touch into this, and we'll go, we'll go forward from this next week. But Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, will effortlessly defeat the greatest army ever assembled. Look at me with verse 14. 
of Revelation 17. It says, these will wage war against the Lamb. How many of y'all have your Bible in here this morning? Raise it up just real quick. We haven't done this in a while. Amen. Do we use this at Crossroads? Why do we use this at Crossroads? This is our authority. This is our authority. I am not our authority. I, I am not. I am just Brandon. I'm a shepherd. I'm pastor, teacher. But this is our authority. Not the Pope. Not the pastor. The Word of God is our authority. These, verse 14, these, these federation, these horns will wage war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them. Somebody say hallelujah. Woo! Why? Because He is the Lord of lords, King of kings. Those who are with Him are the called and the chosen. With Him, the called and the chosen and the faithful. That's us. And that's all believers throughout history. That is all those who have, who have been, who've died in the Lord. That's all those who are raised in the Lord. That is all who are raptured in the Lord. That is all who are with the Lord. The faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the, where the harlot sits are the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. They're all coming against the Lord. <clears throat> These will wage war against the lamb. The lamb will overcome them because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of Lords. The Lord, John MacArthur says this. John says, the Lord Jesus Christ will effortlessly crush the greatest armed force ever assembled when he returns with his elect and the holy angels. Woo! Here we come. We're not going to have much to do with the battle, I don't think. But we are with him. The Bible teaches this very, very clearly. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 says, For after all it is, is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord. Unbelievers, this, if you live into the tribulation, if you are led into greater deception, if you are greater, in greater apostasy, in great delusion, he will deal out retribution to you if you live that long. Verse 14, to those who are with him, and this is where we're going to finish today and may not finish this part, but to say, who are with him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. The called, the chosen, and the faithful. Those who are with him. Matthew 12, 30 says, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Are you with him, church? Are you with the Lord? Are you with him? Are you on his side of things? Are you defending him? Are you defending his word? Are you preaching his word, the gospel of God? Those who are with him, those who are with him, the Bible says here, they are the called and chosen and faithful. I wanted to ask you real quickly, do you refer to yourself as being a part of the called? That Pastor Brandon, I am, I am one of those who have been called, called. All things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Are you a called out one? Are you called? Are you chosen by God? Do you think of yourselves and believe yourselves as being one of those who are chosen by God? The called the chosen, and the faithful. Are you a person that believes you are one of the faithful of God? Do you believe that you are faithful, called, and chosen, and faithful? 
Because those are the ones that are with him. So if you believe you're one of the ones that are with him, then hopefully you believe in your heart that you are called and chosen and faithful. If you do not believe that you are one of the called and one of the chosen, one of the faithful, then you have to think about whether or not you are with him when he comes. I believe the New Testament teaches that the called are already the chosen. Say, so how do you believe that? 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren. Behold, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning. Who? The church in Thessalonica. Paul says, because God has chosen you, when? From the beginning. When were you chosen? Thessalonica, church? Well, it must be from the beginning. And if the church in Thessalonica was chosen from the beginning, are they different from you? The chosen of God at Crossroads Baptist Church that were chosen? Well, I don't believe that, Pastor. I got a, I got a problem with you. What, no, you ain't got a problem with me. Now, let's not make this about me. We're reading the Bible here. Chosen from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And it was for this... For this, he's called you from the beginning, or excuse me, he's chosen you from the beginning. It, is, it was for this he called you. Called you how? Through the gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I love that scripture. I don't know if you like that. I don't know if you love that. I don't know if you believe that. But I want to ask you again, are you chosen by God from the beginning for salvation? Well, either you are or either you're not. Either you believe it or you don't. Either you read it or you don't. Either you cut it out of your Bible or you don't. Called through the gospel. Called that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Called through the gospel of the apostles. Called through the gospel of what we read about in Scripture. Not some made-up gospel, not something we believe is gospel but the gospel of scripture. This is how God calls people to himself. This is how God calls people out of spiritual death to spiritual life. It is through the gospel, the preaching of the good news of the grace of God and the gospel of God. Preach the gospel to yourselves, to your kids, to the indifferent, to people who want to hear it, to people who don't want to hear it, to your family, to your spouse, to your community, and to the world. Preach the gospel because the gospel is how God calls his chosen people to himself. You, uh, as you preach the gospel, you know, there are, there are people who are indifferent to the Lord. Have you noticed? <laughs> they don't care. They don't, they're not worried about their eternity. They're doing everything they can to distract themselves from the reality that they're going to die and they're going to face God in judgment. But here's, the gospel, here's, here's some elements of the gospel. What we're preaching to ourselves always, what we're preaching to our children, our wives, our spouses, to the world, you are spiritually dead in sin, but your sins can be forgiven. Anybody say that's good news? Your sins can be forgiven by God, who is the one you have sinned against. Sin is transgression of God's law. It is a rebellion against what God has said is true and right and wrong. That's what sin is. What the world's tried to do is say this, it ain't sin no more. What the world and the culture's trying to tell us is it's different now. What used to be sin ain't sin no more. Now, who are you to make that up? Who are you to say what's been wrong for thousands of years is no longer wrong? And what's right for thousands of years is no longer right? Who are we, culture, to tell God what is and what is not right and wrong? 
but we can be forgiven. You see, the, what, the, what the world has tried to do is say, I, forgiven of what? I don't need his forgiveness. I don't need God. Post-Christian culture. If there's ever been, if there's ever been in the world a culture that was predominantly influenced by Christianity, you would say America has been, and you would say that that America is now post-Christian. There's no semblance of it. There's no, there's no imagery of it. There's nothing in the world today that you could say that it ever was Christian, that it ever had a Christian influence. The only place you find it, and I believe this with all my heart, the only place you find it is in a Bible preaching church. It's the only place to be exposed to be exposed to the true faith and to the true gospel of God is in a Bible-believing church and through a Bible-believing church that is witnessing in the community and sharing their faith, unashamed belief in the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Your life, your sins can be forgiven. Good news. Your life can be changed. Somebody say amen. That's good news. Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Somebody say, that's good news. The cross, the atonement, the sacrifice of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the eternal life of Jesus, the salvation that is offered to this world is the good news. That we are saved by faith alone, not by works. We are saved through Christ alone, no other name. We are saved through the gospel alone. There is no other pathway. We are saved through the scripture alone, that there's no other authority. But we will be called because we are chosen by God. It is more than an invitation. It is an invitation responded to and accepted. Romans 8, 28, for we know that God causes all things to work together for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Romans 1, 6, among you, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. It's all about the caller. It is not about the called. It is all about the one who called us. It is all about the one who's chosen us. It is all about the one who saves us. It is all about the one who died for us. It is not about us. It is about the glory of God. First Peter, called out of what? Called into what? Called why? First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why did God call us so that we might proclaim the excellencies of him? And that is what I'm doing today. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, it was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 7, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Called as saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, are you called as a saint? Somebody say, I ain't no saint. Never thought of myself as a saint. Called as saints. Why? Romans 9, 23 through 24. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. Amen that we would know the riches of his glory, that we would make known the riches of his glory. The called, the chosen, and the faithful. Romans 8, I can't, fit, I can't miss this verse. And we know that God causes all things to work together for those who, call, who love God and are called according to his purpose. Called according to his purpose. What is that talking about? Look at this verse. Is it up? Romans 8, 28 through 31. I want y'all to see it. We're blank. That's all right. Listen. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. 
and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The called. Paul's thinking are, the called are those that were elect from all eternity. Say, Pastor, you have just lost me, man. I have never heard this in my entire life. I want to want you to look at this verse again. Are you the called? Do you think of yourselves? Do you believe you were and have been and are called by God? Do you think of yourself as being the elect, the chosen, the adopted? The foreknown, do you believe that you were foreknown by God? Do you believe that you were predestined by God? You know, I've actually had church people come to me, I preach, I say, talk about verses like this, I go, Pastor, I don't believe in no predestination now. Then this Sunday, particular Sunday, all I did was read the verse. I don't believe in no predestination. Well, then you do not believe the Bible. Your, your struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with against the Bible. The Bible says, and these whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he justify they say I don't have a problem with justification I just have a problem with predestination well you have a problem (laughs) so we are all because you don't believe in predestination we are all going to cut that word out of our Bibles should we do that upon the testimony of one or two witnesses no The question is, were you foreknown? Were you predestined? Let's read another verse just real quick. Blessed be Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Now, you may not believe in predestination, but the apostle Paul does. Emphatically. You know the one who was knocked off his donkey and blinded and made an apostle to write over half of the New Testament? You know that guy? The apostle Paul believes in what you don't believe in. Were you predestined? Were you justified? Have you already been glorified? Do you believe that you were were and have been blessed by God, that you are beloved by God, that you are chosen before the foundation of the world, that you were predestined to be adopted as his children? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Would you say... Would you stand up? I'm going to say it. I have been called by God. I have been chosen by God. I've been foreknown by God. I've been predestined by God. I've been elected by God. I've been adopted by God. I've been blessed by God. I am the beloved of God. Glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can you say that? Do you know that in your heart? You say, Pastor, what about personal responsibility here? What about personal accountability? And what about the decision that I made to follow Jesus? And what about my free will? And what about obeying the Lord and obeying the gospel and obedience? What about all of that? I ain't talking about that today. I'm not talking about that. 
talking about what God has done in your life and in my life and that we are going to be with him, the called and the chosen and the faithful to stand against the greatest army that has ever been on the face of the earth. And we are going to come with him, with the angels in the clouds back to this earth to rule and reign with him in his glory for a thousand years. I ain't talking about your free will and your responsibility. And I'll just be honest with you. I don't understand how these two things work together. If somebody tells you they do, they are probably lying. We do not deny our personal responsibility, do we? We do not deny our free choice to follow Jesus, to believe in Jesus. But I'm going to tell you this, friend. At this church, we will never deny the biblical doctrines of grace, which says from beginning to end, from eternity past to eternity future, my salvation and the glory of my life and the worship of my life is to him and to him alone, to nobody else. Because he loves me and I am his beloved. Chosen people for his own glory to show the excellencies of his grace. Now, guys, if you don't think this is excellent, if you're yawning and ready to go to lunch, I understand. I'm hungry too. And I love you. But guys, if this doesn't put a fire in you, and a love and a glory for God in you to say, God, thank you for saving me. And that is why I am with you as your faithful one. Then I don't know what could light your fire, friend. If that doesn't light your fire, your wood is all wet. Because he's good. He's good. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I want to follow. I want to follow this Jesus that you're describing today. I want to believe upon him. I want to surrender my life to him. Because in my heart right now, there's nothing else, no one else in this whole world that I want to serve, that I want to follow other than this Jesus that you're talking about. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, that's me. I want to follow Christ. I want to, I want to turn away from all other gods, all other idols, all other ways, all other paths. I want to turn away from my sin. I want to turn away from me serving me. And I want to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to give my life to him today. Would you lift your hand? Every head bows, every eye closed. Lift your hand. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Lift it up high. Lift it up high. Thank you. I want to follow Jesus today. Give my life to him. Thank you. There's young people. There's, there's, uh, there's adults in this room. They're lifting their hands to say, I want to follow this Jesus today. You have heard the good news of the grace of God. And so I want to invite you just right now in your heart. Just your head bowed before the Lord, humble in your heart. I invite you, just simply pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I come to you today. I come to you, Lord, to follow you. I believe in you. I trust you. And I give my life to you. Lord Jesus, I come today and I turn away from my sin. I turn away from all the other idols, all the other gods, all the other paths and ways and I come to follow Jesus, to follow you alone in my life. I ask you right now, Lord, to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I ask you to make me a brand new person in Christ. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would adopt me as your child. Adopt me, oh God, as your servant, as a faithful one. I ask you, Jesus, to justify me, to make me right before you in the eyes of God. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of all of my sins. Cleanse me of all that I've done that I know that is sinful against you. 
And I ask you, Jesus, to transform me, make me a brand new person in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for the miracle today of you making me a brand new person. Lord, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. I know that I'm not perfect, but you are. And I'm seeking you, and I'm loving you. Lead me, Lord Jesus, I pray in Christ's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise for what he's done in this room today? Amen. If you, lifted your, if you lifted your hand, you prayed with me, you trusting the Lord, believing in the Lord. Guys, I'm telling you, there's a lot of folks in here today that needed, that needed forgiveness and needed to follow Jesus. I just want you to know, if, you're, if, you, if, you started, if you started today with Jesus, you are not alone. There are a lot of folks in here. Listen, listen. It is not for you to just come in here and receive that and then leave and we never see you again or you never come back to the church. We want you to, want you to find a Bible-believing church, get plugged in, start growing in the Lord, find people that you know that have been walking with the Lord for a long time, that know the Lord, that know the Bible, and, and that they'll start teaching you and helping you grow in Christ. As, as, our, you know, as this young lady is coming to be baptized in just a few moments, guys, that's the next step for you to obey the Lord and following in believer's baptism, to follow Jesus and being baptized by immersion, to grow in your faith. And the last thing I want to ask you to do, look, look at me. If you, if you, many lifted their hands, listen, please come tell one of us as a pastor, tell someone that you love, tell someone that you know knows the Lord. Uh, tell somebody before your head hits the pillow today, talk to somebody about the decision that you made today to follow Jesus Christ. Will you do that? Amen. Love you. We're going to have an invitation. Uh, this altar is open for you to come and pray and seek the Lord and pray for our community, pray for our nation, pray for our leaders, pray for each other. Uh, just seek the Lord to repent, to surrender, whatever it is. Let's stand together. Stephen, lead us in this worship song. Amen. Amen.